Hello, I am Dr. Sandeep Atre, your social and emotional intelligence coach for this session. I am founder of Socialigence, a venture that specializes in the development of social and emotional intelligence. And I am also author of two books, Understanding Emotions Logically and Observing Nonverbal Behavior. In the last 18 years, I have coached professionals, educators and students and I am excited to assist you in the pursuit of learning this all important skill of social and emotional intelligence. So let's begin. So what is social and emotional intelligence? Simply put, social and emotional intelligence is the ability to adapt one's behavior on the basis of awareness of one's own emotions and attunement with others emotions. Yes, it is the base skill of all interpersonal and intrapersonal competencies. As you can see, social and emotional intelligence has three components, awareness, attunement and adaptability. Awareness is observing subtle cues and underlying dynamics in both self and social environment. Attunement is accurately interpreting these observations for cognitive and emotional empathy and adaptability is utilizing those interpretations to customize one's behavior for interpersonal synchrony. Well, social and emotional intelligence is not just some talent one is born with. It is a skill that can be learnt, practiced and mastered. In this session, we will learn about these three components of social and emotional intelligence, awareness, attunement and adaptability through three points related to each component. And yes, we will follow bigger beginnings, lean later approach. That is, we will invest considerably more time in discussing the initial concepts and then utilize that momentum to build speed towards the end. So, here we begin. First, awareness. Let us begin by learning the foundational skill of awareness. Our first point under awareness is let us have a whole brained approach in classroom. For this point, let us begin by understanding the design of our brain. The species of humans has evolved from its preceding life forms as a gradual upgrade that happened over a period of millions of years. Thus, human brain was not designed from scratch but has got developed in stages with each earlier stage retained in the lower levels. This is the basic concept behind the theory of the trion brain. Yes, we have three brains. Brain 1, the bottommost layer is called the brain stem, the reptilian brain. It takes care of survival functions like breathing, hunger, thirst, temperature control, fight or flight fear responses, defending territory etc. Brain 2 wrapped around brain 1 is called the limbic system, the mammalian brain. It supports functions related to emotions, behavior, motivation, memory, etc. And brain 3 is the cortex, the primate brain. Cortex and specially its specific part prefrontal cortex takes care of functions like complex social interactions, advanced planning, decision making, perceiving language, intellectual learning, etc. In general, the lower brains orient and energize the upper ones which in turn guide and inhibit the lower ones. So, a game of bottom up impulses and a top down regulation is continuously on inside us. And the essence of social and emotional intelligence lies in our ability to acknowledge the nature and needs of each of these three brains inside us and in the students we work with. Consequently, the first implementable point is that in our orbit of influence, it is important to bring a whole brained orientation. That is, we have to create an environment where students feel secure, connected and keen to learn. This balance and integration helps all three layers of students try and brain get their needs met and the results will be greater fulfillment and higher receptivity. We should not forget that we human beings are essentially social animals and we are wired to connect. As in the course of evolution, we were not the fastest or the strongest. What worked for us was that we were smarter and socially connected. Well, 
although civilization outpaced evolution to create what we today know as the modern humans, the fact is that those social connections still form the basic fabric of our lives. And the basis of these social connections is our only social organ, the brain. And our brains, try and brain design solicits that a classroom needs to be not only intellectually invigorating and academically enriching, but should also foster interpersonal connections between the teacher and the students, as well as among students themselves. In other words, the quotation, they don't care how much you know, unless they know how much you care, is not just a quote. It is the basic premise of social and emotional intelligence in teaching. Well, now let's talk about the second point. Let's acknowledge the importance of our own emotional awareness. Before anything else, a teacher has to first be a sorted person. Let us ask, what does the brain do most of the times? Well, even while the rest of the brain is quiet, four neural areas remain active, ever ready for a quick response. And incidentally, three of these four areas are involved in observing and judging people. And these neural zones automatically increase their activity when people think about or watch others interact. So, as teachers, what it means to us is that our emotional state and behavior have an impact even when we are not actively engaged with the students. Moreover, as teachers are in a position of authority, the impact is even greater. That's why it is necessary for a teacher to be aware of his or her own emotional state. Let's see how we as teachers can do it. The source word of emotion is motor, Latin word for to move. So emotions, negative or positive, inherently command movement of some or other kind. This movement might be external to the body or internal to it, yet it is there. Moreover, emotions are transient. They change all the time in response to the constant changes in our situations or our changing perceptions of the situations. This ever-present physiology of emotions inside each of us is the determinant of our choices, behaviors, and actions. In other words, what we do outside is majorly a manifestation of what is happening inside us. That's why the first and foremost part of social and emotional intelligence is our ability to stay tuned to this dynamics of emotions inside us. They are also called autonomic signals. Change in breathing, change in heart rate, dryness in the mouth, labored gulping, a tickle in the throat, a changed blinking rate, tensing of body, clamping of limbs, increased perspiration, all of them are outcomes of evolution's programming of our body. But they are also important pieces of information that our body gives to us. Yes. Our body tells a lot, provided we listen to it. This ability to pay attention to one's inner state is called self-awareness. This self-awareness is what helps us postpone a reaction, avoid a confrontation, take a breather, or not say a word too many. Thus, it is important to deliberately and systematically reflect on one's feelings at a given point of time. However, self-awareness also entails something even deeper. While listening to the physiology of our body gives us a peek into our emotional state, it is important to be able to figure out what lies beneath this. The thoughts, the motives, the beliefs, the insecurities, the concerns, the biases or the complexes. They form an integral part of ourselves and our thinking operates through them, setting the roots for our emotions. A teacher with social and emotional intelligence is supposed to be aware of these mental mechanisms that form emotional roots and offset or limit their intervention. This requires regular practice of emotional hygiene, that is giving outlet to the accumulated negative emotions through activities like writing, discussing, exercising or volunteering. As teachers, we have to learn to learn from life's experiences without accumulating the residual prejudices. Let's come to the third point. Let's practice empathy. No matter how insignificant or short an interaction is, it always carries an emotional undertone. And social and emotional intelligence is about being a responsive receiver of these emotions. And simply put, 
empathy is making someone feel understood and felt. And it is more about willingness than ability. Because scientists have discovered that we already have the required toolkit. We have mirror neurons, a special class of brain cells that fire not only when we perform an action, but also when we observe someone else make the same movement. Thus, if we witness someone's feeling with immersion, then we virtually live it. And that's how a certain neural resonance gets created between two persons, which helps us in preparing an instantaneous and befitting response. But this can only happen when you are there, mentally present, emotionally receptive, and intellectually flexible. And there are clear ways to do so. First, the first way to empathize by paying undivided attention. The ability to empathize stems from our limbic system with circuitry involving a brain part called amygdala. When we pay undivided attention, then it reads the other person's face, voice and gestures for emotions and helps us continually attune to how the other person feels by sending a stream of messages like, oh, they got a bit upset with that idea. Mm, looks a little bored now. Wow, they like that point. These pieces of information are then used by our prefrontal cortical areas to fine tune what we say or do next. The second way to empathize is to resist the temptation of multitasking and to listen actively. A tilt towards the person, a nod to acknowledge the emphasis points, giving verbal or vocal feedbacks, expressing the emotions that you feel or can mirror, these all are indicators of your involvement in the process and has assuring and reassuring effect on the students. The third way to empathize is to have a conversational approach by asking open-ended questions and paraphrasing the other person's key points to confirm that you have understood the very essence of what was being said. However, it is important not to interrupt or override, and it is equally crucial to not be in a hurry to criticize, conclude, judge, or solve. The fourth way to empathize is by imagining what the other person could be thinking and wanting by considering what we know or can reasonably guess about them, and then by trying to think about their motives, fears, concerns, priorities, and our current feeling while tuning into their actions. It is also important to create mental images of what is being said by visualizing the narrative with the protagonist. It kind of becomes neural equivalent of putting oneself in the other person's shoes. The fifth way is to recall one of our own experiences that is closest to the situation the other person is facing. It helps us relive the corresponding feelings and the resultant change in our own physiology helps us connect to the other person's internal state. However, the first step towards empathy remains self-awareness, the earlier point of this session. Yes, teachers who have little awareness of their own emotions show inability to handle interpersonal interactions. Empathetic teachers are excellent at recognizing and addressing the needs of students. They seem accessible and approach interactions with openness. They pick up what people are actually concerned about and then respond on the mark. So, having understood awareness, now let's move to the second component of social and emotional intelligence, attunement. When we talk about attunement, it involves a combination of cognitive as well as emotional empathy. But why would we want to understand someone's emotions? Well, the fact is that if we can understand emotions of students, then we can relate to them in a far more meaningful way. Now, while it seems obvious that words express emotions, the fact is that words can at best express our thoughts on our emotions and a more trustworthy way of understanding emotions is to observe someone's nonverbal behavior. Yes, words express thoughts, body expresses emotions. Nonverbal behavior is such a trustworthy representation of emotions for a reason. While our verbal behavior is guided more by the cortex, the advanced and deliberate part of our brain, our nonverbal behavior is guided more by our evolutionarily older brain parts, 
the limbic system and brain stem, which are more emotional, reactive and unregulated. Yes, the three parts of our brain again come into the focus. That is why our nonverbal behavior represents our emotional state more authentically. And observing nonverbal behavior for these authentic emotions is important because if we can get a clue to someone's emotional state, then we can have a better prediction of the choices they might make and thus can be more prepared with the most apt response on our part. For instance, if we can read discomfort in a student who is not expressing it, then you may extend a helping hand. However, before we discuss the three points related to our second component attunement, it is important to look at the important factors that are to be taken into account while observing and interpreting nonverbal behavior, the three C's. The first is change. Rather than someone's gesture, posture or expression, it is the change in someone's gesture, posture or expression that matters more. So, it is about someone's behavior relative to what researchers call baseline behavior someone's usual behavior in an emotionally neutral state. Second is context. Cues of nonverbal behavior have to be interpreted in terms of occasion, conditions and a person's life situation. Third is culture. The interpretation of nonverbal cues has to be filtered through culture simply because it shapes the way people learn to regulate the expression of their emotions. Now, in the light of three C's, let us talk about the first point of attunement. Let us observe the orientation and gesticulation of students. The most trustworthy way to infer someone's attitude towards somebody or something is to carefully observe his or her orientation. And there is a strong evolutionary reason for this. The area of torso houses most of the vital internal organs and in our evolutionary history, any harm to any of these organs would have been fatal. As a part of that legacy, we all have an instinctive tendency to safeguard it. Thus, we normally expose our torso only in front of people we really trust. An effort to cover or protect it in any form is a reliable sign of discomfort in someone's presence. This behavior is equally telling if it occurs in reaction to an idea or a proposition. A related point is the subject of liking. Just like all other animals, we get closer to something we like and try to maintain a distance from something we do not like. Famous researcher Albert Mehrabian called this immediacy. According to him, immediacy is the degree of perceived physical or psychological closeness between people, manifesting in either approach or avoidance. In our civilized world, where it is not possible to simply approach or avoid, this immediacy manifests in three possible ways. The first is actual distance. The obvious first one is actual distance. However, when it is not possible to maintain actual distance, then it is substituted by angular distance. In angular distance, a person's upper body unconsciously squares up, addresses or aims at those whom they like or agree with. But angles away from people they dislike or with whom they disagree. This immediacy can manifest in gross movements like a sudden shift in the body position or even in the subtle ones like shifting one's position in the chair or shifting one's weight in the chair. The third one is attention distance. When angular distancing is not possible, then people may choose attention distance. In attention distance, people simply move their head or eyes towards or away from the person or thing. This approach or avoidance behavior holds true not only for head and torso, but also for legs or arms or hands. And again, this behavior is equally telling if it comes as a reaction to an idea or a proposition. Another important cue of a student's mental and emotional state comes from gesticulation. These gesticulations are mainly of two types, illustrators and manipulators. First, let us talk about illustrators. Illustrators are used to illustrate the feelings behind the words which are being spoken. They are often used when one does not find a word or for explaining ideas that are difficult to put into words. Although any part of the body can be used as illustrators, brow and upper eyelid movements are used often and hands are used the most. 
illustrators increase with one's involvement in what is being said. And that's why when people feel any positive or negative emotions like excitement or anger, they tend to make more gestural movements than usual. On the contrary, people use illustrators less than usual in any of the three cases. When they have less emotional investment or involvement in what they are saying, when they are having trouble deciding what exactly to say and when they are cautious about what they are saying. Let us talk about manipulators now. Manipulators are the movements in which any part of the body manipulates another body part. Typically, hand is the manipulator and the recipient of the act is either a prop or another part of the body. That is why many actions like holding, scratching, picking, rubbing or grooming takes place during manipulation. Manipulators are not necessarily restricted to hands. Gestures related to legs, the mouth or shoulders also qualify as manipulators. Almost everyone has his or her own idiosyncratic manipulator and the person seems to inevitably revert automatically to that when they feel unease. Manipulators express discomfort and they increase markedly as a person becomes increasingly nervous. It is important to observe this while counselling students. Well, let us talk about the second point now. Let us observe the expressions of students. While orientation and gesticulation can tell you the emotional state a person is in, only the face can tell which exact emotion a person is feeling. Yes, the face is where emotions primarily appear. What the body shows is actually how a person is responding to those emotions. There are specific facial expressions pertaining to each of our emotions. These expressions are the legacy of our evolution, are unadulterated and have been found to be universal. So how many universal discrete emotions can the face show? Well, putting together the works of Charles Darwin, Duchesne, Ernst Huber, Robert Plutchik and Sylvan Tompkins, two researchers Paul Ekman and Wallace V. Friesen established that there are seven emotions that human face can convey. These are happiness, sadness, surprise, fear, anger, disgust and contempt. Before we go on to discuss about these exact emotions, you might ask why hone in on knowing the exact emotion? Why sweat so much on subtle differentiation? Well, that is the difference between a commonsensical teacher and a teacher with social and emotional intelligence. Only an understanding of how to spot a particular emotion can help one choose the most apt and purposeful response. For instance, if a teacher is discussing disagreement with a student, then it is important to spot whether the student is feeling sadness, fear or anger, as in each case what is required to be done on teacher's part would differ greatly. This ability to fine tune or refine responses in behavioral situations and relationships is at the heart of social and emotional intelligence. Talking about universal expressions of the seven basic emotions, each of them has a specific nuanced configuration in all three portions of the face, upper, middle and lower. To spot an emotion, it is important to be conversant with all the details as well as the characteristic features of all of them. For instance, real sadness is characterized less by the drooping corners of lips and more by the raised inner corners of the brows, as this movement is involuntary and relatively harder to fake. Or for that matter, characteristic of a genuine smile is the crow feet wrinkles around the outer corners of the eyes due to involvement of the orbicularis oculi muscle. Then, there are expressions that look similar but have subtle differences. Like in both fear and surprise, the upper eyelids are raised. But the difference is that in fear, the lower lids also get raised and tense. Then there is anger that is often masked by a smile but gets leaked through a nose flare. Well, due to constraints of time in this session, it is not possible to talk about detailed configuration of expression of each of the emotions. But every teacher should get trained in this aspect and then apply the knowledge of those configurations to observe expressions and understand the underlying emotions. 
Well, let us talk about the third point of our second component. Let us observe the vocal cues of students. Apart from postures, gestures and expressions, another aspect comes in nonverbal behaviors per view, vocal cues. There is always a difference between what is said and how it is said. And authors Knapp and Hall capture the essence of this beautifully when they say mostly how something is said is what is said. Well, human beings are giftedly capable of manipulating their voice to communicate various meanings. In fact, the author Mehrabian devised a famous formula for illustrating this effect, which although is limited by the design of his experiments, gives a fair idea of the importance of vocal cues. And that is, perceived attitude is equal to 0 0.07 verbal plus 0 0.38 vocal plus 0.55 facial. The most important vocal cues are thrust, pitch, volume and tempo. Thrust is the stress given on a syllable that renders it prominent within a word or a sentence. It relates to the meaning intended to be conveyed. Pitch can be understood as the degree of highness or lowness of a tone. It relates more to the quality of sound governed by the vibrations producing it. Volume is the loudness of sound. It has more to do with the amount of a sound. Tempo is the rate or speed of sound. It relates to number and duration of pauses while speaking. Let us take thrust first. A sentence can convey different meanings when the thrust is on a different word. For instance, if in the sentence I stood by you, the thrust is on I, then it conveys that the person wants to draw attention to the fact that only they stood by you and no one else. If thrust is on stood by, then it may be to convey that they supported you while others might have just paid a lip service. And if the thrust is on you, then it means that the person chose you over others to stand by. Thus, it is important to carefully focus on the thrust emphasis of someone's sentences. When it comes to the other three, pitch, volume and tempo, their different combinations get manifested in different emotions. Although there is always an element of subjectivity involved in this domain, some important generalizations can still be made. Let us see some of these. Here are some examples of how vocal cues might manifest for different emotions. When pitch is high, volume is low and tempo is high, it shows restlessness or anxiety. When pitch is low, volume is high, tempo is high, it shows dominance or suppressed anger. When pitch is high, volume is low and tempo is low, it shows concern or fear and when pitch is high, volume is high and tempo is low, it means appealing or persuading. So, there is a strong connection of vocal cues to emotional state. A teacher with social and emotional intelligence has to pay attention to vocal cues to understand intent behind a student's communication. Now, having understood awareness and attunement, let us move to the third component of social and emotional intelligence, adaptability. Now, we will learn the third component of social and emotional intelligence, adaptability. That is, utilizing all that we have learnt to customize one's behavior for interpersonal synchrony. In adaptability, the first point is, let us adjust our emotional state to serve the purpose at hand. Up until now, we have been discussing about being a responsive receiver of emotions. But social and emotional intelligence requires one to also be a responsible transmitter of emotions. The most interesting characteristic of the limbic system, our brain's emotional center that we discussed in component 1, is what scientists call its open loop nature. An open loop system depends on external sources to manage itself. This made sense in evolutionary terms because it helped humans to come to each other's rescue in distress and aided group living. This open loop feature still holds in modern humans. Even today, a person's sheer presence has the ability to alter hormone levels, cardiovascular function and even the immune systems working inside the body of another person. Yes, our physiology is intermingled to create either limbic resonance, positive or limbic dissonance, negative. And this effect is even more pronounced if there is nonverbal interaction and verbal exchange. 
This renders one point absolutely true that emotions are contagious. People in groups unavoidably catch feelings from one another, from frustration and anxiety to relaxedness and euphoria. And that is why a teacher has to be responsible transmitter of emotions. For that, irrespective of the age group one is dealing with, a teacher will need to create limbic resonance in interactions with students. Because teachers are in a position of authority, they set the emotional climate of a classroom. That is why it is important for us, the teachers, to maintain the emotions that are appropriate for the outcome we wish to achieve. And it is possible even without the theatrics or showmanship. For instance, by showing mild anxiety to invoke more carefulness and focus or maintaining a sober mood while handling risky situations or an upbeat playful tone when creativity is needed. The fact is that emotions and moods when transmitted adeptly cause a perceptual skew. That is the tendency to look for cues that match inner state of emotions. So, it augurs well if we can set the right tone. Let us talk about the second point of adaptability. Let us adapt a role according to situation. As a teacher, there are multiple possible roles that one can play. As a famous model explains, they are preaching, to advocate and urge acceptance of or compliance with moralistic values, mentoring, to teach and guide through wisdom, experience and insight, training, to develop skill and craft leading to better results, tutoring, to be a guardian, giving individual instructions, counseling, to provide advice and direction, therapy, to do remedial action through caring and comforting, coaching, to facilitate a behavioral change by brainstorming and dialogue, a one to one process, consulting, to do mirroring or horizon expansion with someone equally informed for generating advices and alternatives. To practice adaptability, we should apply the concepts discussed in the first two components, awareness and attunement to assess which role has to be adopted in the given circumstances and then play that role effectively. Let us talk about the last point of adaptability. Let us customize our teaching style to suit the need. As a teacher, there are multiple possible tools that one can select. They are examples, humor, anecdotes, group tasks, analogies, role plays, questions, simulations, competition, games and activities, audio visuals, assignments, stories, tests. To practice adaptability, we should apply the concepts discussed in the first two components, awareness and attunement to assess which tool has to be selected in the given circumstances and then deploy it effectively. So, before we end, let us revise the definition of social and emotional intelligence. It is the ability to adapt one's behavior on the basis of awareness of one's own emotions and attunement with others emotions. I hope you got valuable insights on what social and emotional intelligence is and how to apply it in teaching. I, Dr. Sandeep Atre would like to thank you for listening and wish you great fulfillment and success in the profession of teaching.